Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Earth Engine User Meetup. Today, we are having the last session for this year. And the slides for today's meetup will be available at https um, bit.ly slash eum underscore 19 DEC 2022. So thanks for joining us again. I'm Sabrina Zito. I am a geospatial consultant and also a Google Earth Engine, um, Earth Engine developer expert. So for those of us who may be watching from a different time zone or unable to join us live right now, we'll be recording this session and you can watch it later on our YouTube channel, which is available here. So feel free to take a look at also some of the past videos that have been um, recorded. So today we have two speakers. We're excited to welcome Matilda Anoki from Southern University and A&M College. She'll be presenting on mapping urban heat island for different land cover types in Louisiana, USA, a COVID-19 case study. Followed by a second speaker, Julia Tai, also from Southern University, and she will be presenting on monitoring water quality in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, USA, using Google Earth Engine. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Matilda to please share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Hello everyone, my name is Matilda Anoche and this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you find yourself, I am presenting on mapping urban heat island for different land cover types in Louisiana, which is a COVID-19 case study. Yes, so, um, Urban areas are, I'm sorry, urban areas have been known to experience um, a lot of higher temperatures than their outlying areas. And this difference in temperature is what constitutes an urban heat island effect. The difference in temperature has to do with changes in radiative and thermal properties of impervious surfaces, such as we see here, that the dark surfaces that absorb and trap the heat and also um, interstructural canyons that retain the heat and also waste heat, waste heat from vehicles and machinery. Um, the difference in temperature has to do with changes in radiative and thermal properties of the imperial surfaces, that is the heat absorbing buildings and pavements. Temperatures vary within cities due to the spatial distribution of water, soil, vegetation, and imperial surfaces. So from this, um, from this, we can see that the some areas such as the buildings, imperial uh, areas, are very liable to obstructing um, the flow of um, natural air, and as a result, there's a lot of heat that is being retained in these areas. And then on the right side, you can see lack of green infrastructure, that is trees for shade and evapotranspiration. Um, the objectives of this um, study is to create a land cover for the three study areas and also to perform a land surface temperatures to assess the urban heat island for before and after the COVID-19 lockdown here in Louisiana and to extract the land surface temperature for the different land cover classes. So we are going to look at some causes of urban heat island effects. Um, the first thing is um, albedo and infrastructure. We all know that asphalt, concrete, and um, some bricks absorb and reflect the sun's heat, therefore causing um, surface temperatures and air temperatures to rise due to their thermal storage capacity. The second thing is reduced vegetation in urban areas. And with that, 
you know that um, forest and vegetation areas minimizes the natural cooling effect of shading and evapotranspiration from soil and vegetation. And there are also anthropogenic activities from vehicles, air conditioning units, buildings, and industrial facilities, which all emit heat into the urban environment. Also, the urban geometry of tall buildings act as obstacles and reduce wind flow, which would bring cooling effects. Another factor is weather. Um, calm and clear weather conditions result in minimizing amounts of solar energy um, reacting urban surfaces. And conversely, the strong winds and cloud cover suppress the heat island formation. With regards to geography, large bodies of water can moderate temperature while nearby, nearby mountains can um, block wind or create wind patterns that pass through a city. So these are some causes of urban heat islands, as I've mentioned. And then I'll talk about types of urban heat islands. So we have um, the surface urban heat islands and we have the atmospheric urban heat islands. So the surface heat island, it represents the radiative temperature difference between the impervious and the natural surfaces. And um, surface urban heat islands tend to be most intense during the day when the sun is shining. And their magnitude varies with seasons, but it is typically largest during um, the summer times. And surface urban heat islands are primarily measured by remote sensing in the thermal infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we talk about the atmospheric urban heat islands. And this refers to the radiative effects in the canopy layer or the boundary layer. When I talk about the canopy layer, I'm referring to the layer of air from the surface to the electromag to the from the surface to the tree tops or like a shrub, the, the top of a shrub or the top of a roof. And it is measured by institute sensors that are mounted on fixed meteorological, meteorological sensors. And then for the boundary layer, heat islands, from the boundary layer, the heat islands extend from the treetop or the rooftop to where urban um, landscape no longer influence the atmosphere. And this is measured by um, tall towers, radio scones, and um, aircraft. So why are urban heat islands a problem? First of all, we talk about a risk, increased risk of heat related mort mortality and morbidity in the sense that um, urban heat islands contribute to respiratory difficulties. They also contribute to heat cramps and exhaustion. They contribute to non-fatal heat stress and heat related mortal mortality. And this is mostly found in the case of children, older adults, and those with existing health conditions are particularly um, at the, at, they are the mercy of this particular risk of urban heat island. And then there's increased energy consumption. When there are heat islands, definitely people would want to cool down or they would want to um, have a colder environment. And as a result, they stick to um, using air conditioners. And these are um, machines that take a lot of energy. And because of that, there's a lot of energy consumption, which comes to my next point, which is elevated emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases. As there's an increased demand for energy consumption, there's definitely going to be a lot of emissions in the atmosphere because Electricity that is providing this is definitely coming from the burning of fossil fuels. And this has goes a long way to affect um, the climate change of a particular area. Yes, and also the last thing is water quality. Um, surface urban heat islands degrade water quality, mainly by thermal pollution. The water temperature affects all aspects of the aquatic life, especially the metabolism and reproduction of many aquatic species. Yeah, so for this um, this research, I looked at three different study areas in Louisiana. And the first study area is East Baton Rouge. 
the second study area is New Orleans and then um, Lafayette. Yeah, so the study area, the East Baton Rouge study area, eh, the population for that county is 440 and 59. And then the average temperature is between 52 degrees Fahrenheit and 83 degrees Fahrenheit. And for New Orleans, the population is 390, 390,144. And the average temperature is between 55 degrees Fahrenheit and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the last study area is Lafayette with a population of 121,374 with an average temperature between um, 52 degrees Fahrenheit and 83 degrees Fahrenheit. So the in Louisiana, the COVID-19 lockdown was between 23rd March to April 12th, 2020. And so for this study, I looked at a previous year that is 2019 and then that the period during the lockdown that is the from between the 23rd March to April 12th, 2020. So this is before the COVID lockdown and then during the COVID lockdown. I this research um sought to look at the impact that the COVID lockdown had on um the urban heat island or the land surface temperature in these three study areas. Yeah, so the satellite and sensor that I used was the Landsat 8, which has a 100 meter resolution and graded at 30 meter, 30 meter spatial resolution with a revisitation day of 16 days. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to speak about the methodology that I used for this um, analysis. So first of all, um, I use First of all, for data acquisition, I acquired the Landsat ACE um, Level 2 Tier 2 catalog data set from Google Earth Engine. And then from there, I came to pick it, moved to the processing where the values were converted from Kelvin to degree Celsius and average over the study period. And then it moved to the analysis where the average land surface temperatures were extracted from the various land cover classes that were created in this study. So um, I would want to talk a little bit about Google Earth Engine. And Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based geospatial processing um, platform, which is available to scientists, researchers, and developers for analysis of the Earth. And it uses Google's computational power it has um, the JavaScript code editor and the Python API, which are the application programming interfaces. And it contains a catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial data sets. And as, as such, this is the platform that I use to carry out my analysis. Yeah, so in deriving the land surface temperature, first of all, um, this algorithm was developed by Sophia Amida. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. So first of all, there are three parameters that are needed for this, um, for analyzing the land surface temperature for the three study areas. And then the first one is NDVI, emissivity, and then brightness temperature. These are the three factors that are necessary for um, assessing the land surface temperature for the three study areas. So I'm going to speak on um, all of these in the next slide. So this production chain was fully coded in JavaScript by Sophia Emida, as I mentioned earlier, using the code editor platform. And she has, it's an open source code where um, you can access these codes, the Git repositories in GEE. So these are the um, links to the code that I used for this analysis. So first of all, we will need to um, characterize our surface emissivity. And in doing this, we need the normalized difference vegetation index. And what then, why do we need the normalized vegetation index? So surface emissivity is mainly dependent on NDVI. And the higher the NDVI, higher NDVI values give higher surface emissivity. And so when we find the NDVI, we find the fractional NDVI that's we find the maximum NDVI and we find the minimum NDVI. So the maximum NDVI 
and the minimum NDVI are two key variables that are input into the emissivity equation for us to get the final land surface temperature for the steady areas. And before this, we need our surface reflectance bands, which we have to apply max clouds to remove clouds from the images that are in the Landsat, the Landsat surface um, reflectance collection. So this is the, um, the production chain that Sophia and Mida used in assessing the land surface temperature for a particular area that you are studying. Yes, and for the extraction of the land surface temperature from the land cover classes, I used um, a Python script for extracting the LST values by using the GMAP package, which was developed by King Shen Wu. And so I used, on the Jupyter Notebook platform, I imported the F engine, um, and then you'd have to authenticate, meaning that you have to um, put in your logins, and then it will give you access to use the GMAP package. And so from there, you import your images, that is the Landsat image and the classified image, and then the steady area to finally give the values for your um, land surface temperature um, for the various class, land cover classes that are under steady. So for the output maps, the first output is the land, the land surface temperature maps for 2019. And over here we have East Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and then New Orleans. So for 29, in 2019, the land surface temperature for East Baton Rouge, the overall land surface temperature was, the highest point was 44.39 degrees and the lowest was 13.45 degrees. And in Lafayette, the highest was 42.65 and the lowest was 15.57. In New Orleans, the highest point, the highest um, LST was 42.64 and the lowest was 16.28. And for 2020, there was um, a very much visible reduction in the LST values in that for East Baton Rouge, the LST reduced, the highest point that was 44, it reduced to 38. And for Lafayette too, there was a reduction. And then for New Orleans too, there was a reduction in the um, highest LST values for after the lockdown. Yes, so I applied a random forest classification algorithm in Google Earth Engine to classify the, um, the land cover for the three study areas into four different classes. That is water, vegetation, built up and bare land. And these are the um, LST distribution curves that were generated from the Python scripts that was used to extract the, value, the LST values from each um, class in the land cover for each of the study areas. So for East Baton Rouge, it can be seen that um, in 2019, the values are more, are more inclined to the right, meaning that they are there was an increase in um, temperature in that period. And in 2020, it's, it can also be seen that the, some of the values for let's say water, vegetation, built up for the four land cover classes, um, they are still, some of them are still um, geared towards or skewed towards the right, which means that not all of the classes um, experienced um, a lower land surface temperature. Some of the classes saw a reduction in their land surface temperature and others saw an increase in their land surface temperature. And this was same for Lafayette. For Lafayette um, in 2019, um, the four land cover classes had um, what we call a liptokesis um, curve, meaning that most of the values are found closer to the mean value. And we can see that water, which had almost like 28, the mean was 28, 
but in 2020, the mean was around 22, 21, meaning that there's been a reduction in the land surface temperature or the temperature for water within this period. And also for built up, which was like 31, was reduced to like 28. So there was definitely a reduction in for this, for built up areas in this period as well. So for Lafayette, we can see that there was a permanent reduction in most of their classes before, after the lockdown. Um, for New Orleans, we see that in 2019, um, there was an increasing trend in, their, in the land surface temperature for all of the classes. But in 2020, you see a decreasing trend towards or skewed to the left, meaning that there was a reduction for most of the classes within this um, period, this COVID-19 lockdown period. So um, with this research, I realized there are some errors and uncertainties with regards to the spatial resolution of the Landsat imagery that, Landsat imagery that I used. And then the, the land surface temperature and the experience temperature, that is the ground temperature, might definitely not be the same. And um, also, I want to consider climate data in this research because it could be that it was not necessarily the COVID-19 um, lockdown that caused this um, reduction in the land surface temperature for the some of the classes in the three study areas. Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, I would like to assess for future work, I'd like to assess the land surface temperature for the previous years to see the trend before the lockdown. And also I'd like to assess climate data in relation to the surface temperature using um, present monthly spatial climate data sets. Thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Matilda. That was a really great presentation. Um, I think some of you may have some questions. So I want to ask everyone now to take a few minutes to write down some of the questions you have, because at the end of the session, you also get a chance to, to ask questions to Matilda and also to Julia. So, with no further ado, I'd like to now hand over the floor to Julia to also um, share her presentation. Thank you, Matilda, again. Thank you, Sabrina. Hi, everyone. Matilda, I think you have to stop sharing your screen. Before yeah, I... sorry. Thank you, Matilda. Okay, Julia, please, you're welcome to share your screen. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you all for joining us today to listen to our talk. Um, so Julia, on Julia, I try... We can actually see your notes as well. Would you be able to, to share somehow without the... Oh, okay, okay. Pause. Let me pause this. All right. So um, thank you all for making time to listen to our presentation today. So I'll be talking to you all about how I, I use the Google Earth engine to monitor the water quality parameters in the Chesapeake Bay, specifically the Virginia subregions. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Google Earth Engine, especially for those who are not familiar about what it is. So the Google Earth Engine is a cloud computing platform which has um, data sets saved in there, which helps to detect the changes and quantify the difference and map trend of the edge surfaces. So it has about 40 years historical data sets, which is lived, saved in its platform, specifically for the Landsat set data, and also Sentinel to modest data and other um, geographical and other data sets saved the NetCloud platform to as well. 
Um, so some of the GE use cases are to ensure sustainable natural resource management, sustainable agriculture and climate change um, or climate risk management, specifically the flood, drought and wildfire um, aspects. So within the GE, there are repositories which are developed to ensure or ease the burden of um, data analysis of researchers. And some of the repositories that I found interesting is the continuous degradation detection, which serves to monitor forest degradation and deforestation. And also there's the GECDC tools, which, which is a suite of to design for continuous land chain monitoring within the Google Earth Engine. And also there's one um, repository that's the GDP code which is an app for creating Landsat time series animations. And there's a palette which helps in creating a colored palette in the um, Google Earth Engine. And there are several other repositories that could be found using the link that going to or hitting the link hptrawesome.gmap.org. So today I'll be talking to you all about the um, one of the repositories that was developed by NASA under its developed program called the OCA. So the OCA is an acronym, which means an optical reef and coastal area assessment tool. And this tool seeks to ensure that or allow stakeholders to effectively monitor coastal water quality parameters within the Mesoamerican reef, that's within the Mexican and the American reef system. And this code could be found using or going to the link below, the link found shared on this platform. That's the, you go to github.com, NASA developed and you go to the OCA. So when you go to this link, um, that's how the interface shows. Then you go to this section, the 2094 Blaze um, section. So when you click on it, you see the code that's been written there and all that you need is to copy the code and copy it into your Google Earth engine. And you don't need any further analysis. All that you need is to select your area of preference within the Mesoamerican Reef area. So when you copy the code into the Google Earth engine, all that you need to do is to hit your run and the code counts. And it uses the graphical user interface, which enable users to add, process and view and export the data. So this is the interface after you hit the run or after you've copied the code from the link that was shared in the previous slide. So it has the first interface that's the start and end date, which you can set your you set your type, your start date and also your end date. And also you can select your area of preference. That's your area of preference has to be within the Mesoamerican reef area. Then in the second interface, you can display your images by selecting either of these parameters that you want your results to be seen. Then you go to the add to images, then it adds it to your image in the Google Earth engine for you. And furthermore, you can export your results to the Google Drive that's if you want to further do any classification or any analysis using the GIS tool. And it also has the time series chart generator section where you can see your results in a, um, in a chart form. If you don't want to see your results in a map form, you can also get your results in a chart form. Um, so with the OCA, it operates um, using the lands at eight levels, level two surface reflectance, the Sentinel two level C one C, the aqua models, the terra models to create a cloud max and a land mass collection based on the preference of what the um, especially if you're a researcher, what based on what you select within the parameters, these are the data sets that it uses to create the cloud max and the land mass collection for you. So for example, if you want to look at the turbidity, the normalized different coral for index, the coral for A concentration and the color dissolved organic matter concentration. It gives you the results based on the filter sentinel to the one C um, uh, information there. And if you want to look at just the turbidity in this, it gives you the filter results from the Landsat 8 level 2 surf surface reflectance. And if you want to look at the uh, sea surface temperature, it gives you the results obtained from the modest uh, surface temperature band that's either from the aqua models or the terra models section. Um, so for this slide, I'm talking about the Chesapeake Bay and why it's important for this study for today. So the Chesapeake Bay is the, one of the largest estuary in the United States, and it is 64,000 miles um, square miles. That's watershed 
is very important and it spans from six states and the districts of Columbia that's spanned from the Virginia subregion through to New York and through to Pennsylvania. And it's also economically important because it's been valued that it generates about billions of dollars annually for the country. However, it's been historically um, polluted and it's been classified under EPA's um, district water, dirty water list for decades now, according to the Chesapeake Bay. And though there are a lot of studies going on within the Chesapeake Bay, its level of pollution keeps on increasing, which is very bad, in spite of its economical importance it has to the states. So, however, within the early part of this year, the middle many, many play, <laughs> <laughs> the middle part of the Virginia area, that's the many places, okay, was declared by NOAA as a habitat focus area. That's it was declared as a habitat focus area because the region in there has a rich um, bed, which serves as um, which is very important for the oysters and other fisheries. Um, that has been declared as that's that's going on extension so they declared this area within the middle peninsula as a habitat focus area to ensure that the aquatic species that are found there that are going extinct are preserved for future purposes and also for preservation purposes so within so the next slide is going to talk about the results that was achieved using the orca section so within the orca i i selected some water quality parameters that the normal difference stability index from 2009 to 2019 to see the difference that has occurred in spite within the stability index so within the 2019 we see that the upstream of the stability was less as compared to 2019 which has a higher stability and within the middle peninsula to we see that the turbidity index there was less as compared to 2019. And then for the coral for A2, you could see that the 2009, the level of the coral for A was less as compared to 2019. So you can see that there are much activities going on in the causing pollution or causing much nutrients in the leading to the high coral for that's obtained there. And this is reducing the level of um, aquatic species or aquatic um, activities in there, as you can see from the slide here. In terms of the surface sea surface temperature, there has been records that the sea surface temperature in the Chesapeake Bay now is very high, which is reducing the level of oysters and other fishes um, species that, that are found within the Chesapeake Bay currently. And you can see from the slide that in 2019 or 2009, the level of the sea surface temperature was less as compared to 2019, which is very high. And within the middle peninsula, you can see that the sea surface temperature in here is very high. And from this slide, you could clearly see that the aquatic vegetation index in 2009 was very high as compared to 2019. So this ensures that there are much activities that needs to be carried out to reduce this uh, previous parameters that was found that in terms of the turbidity, the temperature and the coral for A that's recorded within the chest pain. So in conclusion, I would like to say that Google Earth Engine is one of the platforms that has helped ease the burden of researchers and managers in ensuring and advocating for sustainable management as it has a tons of data saved in its cloud. And it has also eased the burden of data analysis as pre-analysis of most of the data sets has been carried out by developers across the world. And most of these codes can be found on GitHub. So when you just click on type Google uh, GitHub in your Google account, you could see the lot of um, codes that has been developed. And in 2000 and 2022, these are the developer experts that, that are currently developing codes to ease the burden of researchers. And I'm proud to say that one of our very own, Abna Asari and Salvatima from Ghana is part of the development network for the de developers and I'm proud of her and I want to use this opportunity to say thank you to her for introducing me to Google Earth Engine and also for guiding me through the analysis within uh, Google Earth Engine. And she can be followed on either LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll encourage you all to follow her on Twitter as she shares a lot of inspiring stuff and a lot of um, challenging stuff on her Twitter account. And I also like to say thank you to Sabrina, who is the GEO founder of the Women in GEO, 
for this opportunity to give us our talk or share our experience and results using Google Earth Engine. And I also like to say thank you to the NASA Develop team, that is Vanessa, Haley, Alpen, and Roxana for developing this wonderful app which seeks to monitor the water quality parameters within the Mexico-American Reef System. And so one of the developed fellows, that is Caroline Williams, for introducing us to this app during our develop period. And one may ask what's DEVELOP. So DEVELOP is a 10-week research program which serves to break the gap between using the NASA satellite and also to ensure that there's a sustainable management within the environment. So if you are interested and you would like to apply for this program, you just go to this link shared here and you look at the eligibility and the requirements that you need to, then you apply. And I encourage everyone to apply for this program as it's very, it's a very wonderful program, which you're going to learn and learn and you're going to get exposed to several um, other sets like um, data sets that are used in such and sharing sustainable management within the environment. So I'd like to say thank you all, and I could be followed on either LinkedIn or Twitter, and thank you so much, and it's time for questions and answers. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Julia. That was a really great uh, presentation. Um, could you please go back to your previous slide? I think somebody in the chat would like to um, maybe take a look again at the, sorry, at the, the links that you can be contacted at. Oh, the links? Yeah, your your social media links. So if you can stop there for a while, I think then they can. Uh, Is it to Abner's link or to my? Uh, yours, Julia. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, if you'd like to stay in touch with Julia, please take a screenshot now, and then you can also share these links later on. All right, so I'm going to now move to the question and answer part, as Julia mentioned. So I will now change screens. So I welcome all of you to join us to answer questions on slido.com. So if you go to slido.com and use the event code hashtag earth engine, it will take you to the Q&A. Or you can also use your phone, scan the QR code, and it will also take you to the same page. So for those of you who are already there, um, please answer this question. So we're curious where you're joining us from today. Feel free to um, share which country you're joining from today, and then you will see some of the live responses appear uh, here. All right, so there's somebody else from Germany. I'm also currently in Germany, so that's, that's at least oh, a few of us. US, United States, Canada. More people? Okay, sounds like three countries so far. Austria. Great. So it looks like we have people mainly from North America and, and in Europe so far. Okay, so I hope all of you had some time to connect to Slido. And I see some questions are being posted in the chat as well. Could you copy those questions now also into the, the Q&A so that we can um, also share them online and people can see your questions. So I will now open the Q&A. Um, so feel free to, again, post your questions on the live Q&A, uh, joining us at this QR code and just copy and paste the questions that you already wrote in Slack, uh, in, in the Zoom chat into this, into this poll so that we can uh, see that. Thank you so much. Okay, so this looks like a question for Julia. So I welcome Julia back on, on screen. Um, the question is, which reducer statistics does Orca use when analyzing the time series data from 2009 to 2019? Julia, do you have any idea about this or do you have any links maybe you can share? Um, to to tell them what the the reducer statistics are. 
um, actually, I, I don't really have an idea about the reducer statistics in terms of the time series, but um, I would encourage everyone to go to the link. And if there's any questions, they can ask the developers because it's just like, I'm just talking about how the app can be used, but I don't have details about like the statistics aspects, right? Great. So maybe you can paste the, the link to Orca again in, in the chat later, and then I will also share it via email and on the uh, video description after this. Okay, so there great. was another, there's another question for you actually. So okay. the, the next question for you, Julia, is do you think Orca would work for inland lakes? And the lakes um, this person is studying is around 100 to 1,000 square kilometers in area? Um, so it's, it will work within the um, in lakes, but it has to be within the Mesoamerican reef areas. That's within the Mexican American areas. OK, so it's, um, it's possible that their study area may be outside. And however, the code you mentioned is also available on, on GitHub, right? So it could potentially be modified to get the specific parameters that were also being extracted? Yes, yeah. OK. It's a bit of a thing. Great. Thank you. So we have a question for Matilda. Um, they, they mentioned that they missed, they missed something, but they were wondering about the context in which you, you did your research. So Matilda, um, would you be able to come, come back and tell us Tell us a bit yes. more about that, please. Yes, so um, I looked at the period before COVID-19 and the period before the, the period after the COVID-19 lockdown. I'm not sure if that's what the context in there means. Um, yeah, it's a bit unclear. So maybe the person who asked this question, could you elaborate a bit more about what you would like to, to know about? And um, I guess I have a question for the both of you. So what brought you to this topic? How did you get interested in urban heat island, Matilda, and for water quality for Julia? So how, did, how did you come to these topics? Yes, so um, I'm, very, I'm very much passionate about um, how climate change is affecting um, our environment. And I, was, I started to look at the period that is before COVID-19 and then during COVID-19 where there were not a lot of activities going on. I just wanted to see how human activities have, um, you know, the impact that human activity has had on land surface temperature. Um, that is before COVID where the, there was a lot of things going on. And then during the COVID where a lot of people were in their houses and there was a very, very like, suitable atmosphere, a calm atmosphere. And, Definitely, there were not a lot of things going on. And so definitely the human activities would have um, been very, very low. Now. And therefore, um, definitely there will be a reduction in land surface um, temperature. And so I start to look at this um, you know, a technical way. That is why I came to the idea of looking at the land surface temperature before COVID and then looking at land, su land surface temperature after COVID. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of interesting questions related to that when you think about how patterns of human activity change during the lockdown. Because probably, like you mentioned, more people who were able to, they were working from home. And in the main city areas, there might be reduced human activity because businesses were closed during that time. So there's definitely an interesting uh, way to observe how human activity and, and, the, and the urban heat island or surface, land surface temperatures changed during that time. And um, how about you, Julia? How did you come to this topic of water quality? Um, so I came to this topic because I'm much interested in water resources and especially our uh, impacts on our water resources because water is very key and essential for human life. And for Chesapeake Bay, being classified as one of the largest estuaries in the United States, and the risk of its pollution means that we there's much things or much research that needs to 
be carried out to ensure that the level of pollution is reduced so that it serves as um, future benefits for our future generations to though our activities are really affecting it we have to think about what or how it's going to look like in the future time so i decided to work on it and also contribute to especially within the middle peninsula which NOAA seeks to ensure or restore the habitat within that section that's why i came up with this topic and decided to do more research in that area excellent thank you julia so i see that there's a follow-up question for you here so i yeah. will I will push this up now. Um, the question is, why is the water quality getting worse in the Chesapeake Bay? What is driving this? So what's driving this is the pollution and um, other agriculture activities within that bay. So lastly, um, I heard that the EPA and other um, stakeholders within the bay are trying to come up with a policy that the rates of pollution that's caused by farmers into the bay they are supposed to pay a fine for that so that's because as the years had previously they realized that agriculture activities were much within that section especially the apple and other farming activities that was going on there caused a lot of nutrients especially nitrogen and other nutrients released or released into the bay so that's causing the pollution then also most um land cover activities to are causing pollution into the bay so that's what's driving or making it worse but those problems is trying to be solved by the policies that has been created by the epa which says that if you release a certain amount of uh, nutrients or pollution into the water body as a farmer or as a um, organization you're supposed to pay a certain number of fines so that's trying to reduce the level of pollution into the bay now and that's a good thing there. Thanks, Julia. Um, is there also a contribution from, say, human sewage systems? Because I know uh, in some older cities, um, sometimes the, the sewage system is connected to the stormwater runoff system. And when there is a large rainfall or storm event, sometimes the overflow causes the sewage also to enter uh, the bay. I know this is a problem in, in Connecticut, for example, in, in the city of New Haven. So I was just curious if there are also some older stormwater or sewage systems that are connected in, in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, there was, but now I think the EPA is trying to stop them from now. But the major challenge is that agriculture activities as mm -hmm. most um it's leading to, especially in terms of the stability, because when you cut down most percentage of trees, mm -hmm. when it rains, the level of, um, instead of binding the soil together, it's rather leaves or leaches into the nearby streams, which causes a higher stability contest in the bay. So there's one um, organization that's the Virginia DEQ. They are responsible for measuring the stability context. And I happened to visit them during the NASA development program and every they said every month they have to change their stability measurement so that they use a measuring the stability context so that shows that there's a high stability context in there so their problem major is from their agriculture activities activities not the sewage or anything because the sewage has been controlled by the epa so they make sure that it's not leached into the um, nearby streams so the major Thanks, problem is coming from that culture activities. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm gonna switch back to, to Matilda as there are some questions for her as well. So uh, Matilda, uh, you mentioned that the temperature sensors are at canopy level. How does this relate to land surface temperatures as measured by Landsat? Okay, um, I think during my research, I reviewed a paper that stated clearly that um, Landsat's does not, um, la for Landsat's, we can use Landsat to measure air temperature, um, air temperature, but we can actually use it to measure the surface, um, urban surface temperature. And so in this research, the Landsat's aid that I used was used to assess the surface temperature and not, uh, the air temperature. So with the canopy level, 
the canopy level urban heat island is in relation to air temperature, but for Landsat, we can use that to assess air temperature, but we can use that to assess surface temperature. So for the canopy level, that is where we'll be talking about climates, which I said I'll be um, adding that. I'll be looking at that in my future work for this research. Thank you, Matilda. So in terms of climate data, um, one, one data set that comes to mind is the CAMS, the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service, ERA-5 climate reanalysis data. And I, I know that it's also now available in Earth Engine. So it could be interesting to uh, look at how, say, the temperature in 2019 and 2020 compared to maybe the 10-year the or 20-year average for the summer months over time. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of potential there for um, including this climate data into your research and seeing if there's a difference between, um, like what you said, the land surface temperature versus the air temperature or some other climate variable. Yeah. Yeah, and another question for you here is from the, the person who asked about the context early. Uh, earlier on, they were wondering if you know, your study was done for a university project or within like a larger specific research project in an organization. Uh, okay, this research was for a university research project. I am a graduate student, an MSc student at Surrey University a and College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So this research was for a university um, assessment. That's awesome. So do, um, does your program also have a thesis requirement for, for research uh, towards the degree? Just curious. Uh, research requirements? Yes, do you have to yes. like, write a thesis? Yes, I have to write a thesis for my last semester, which is next semester. So yeah, this would be um, a great path that I'm looking at. So I'm going to consider the future work and I'm going to work more on this research. Paper. Excellent. So we hope to, to hear more about the next, next stage of your research coming up in the future. Thanks, Matilda. Okay, so now we have a question for the both of you. And this is looking at um, the different APIs that you used. So I think, Matilda, you were working more with the Python API. Yes. And Julia so, was working um, more with the, the JavaScript code editor and also using some apps um, that were developed with Orca. So the, the speak this question is about how was your experience using either Python or JavaScript? And um, can you tell us a bit more about how you found how you found that? Yes. So um, for assessing the land surface temperature, I did that in the JavaScript using the Java, the JavaScript API. Um, based on Sophia Emides' um, algorithm for calculating land surface temperature. And in trying to extract the land surface temperature values for each class, I had to I create a data frame for each of these classes. And because of that, I had to import the assets that I had, um, the images that I had as assets into um, a, the Python API, which is which I use Jupyter Notebook, and then so over there, I had to create a data frame for it. So I had, I needed Python, Python script. And so I imported um, NumPy and um, Pandas to help me create this um, data frame so that I could plot out the distribution curves for the various classes for the land covers. So I use, that is the reason why I use the Python scripts and then I use the JavaScript for mainly looking at the land cover classification and the land surface temperature estimation. But for extracting the LST values for each class, I had to um, import the, the assets into a Python script and then plot out the distribution curve using Matplotlib. And how, how did you find using the Python API versus JavaScript? Were there some things that were easier to do or some things that were more difficult to do Yes, um, I at the beginning it was a struggle because um, I'm still um, finding my way around um, working with Python. But luckily enough, I had some 
assistance and with some tutorials, I was able to um, come up with a function that can, you know, um, generate the a function that can, you know, break out, break down the classes and then extract the LST values to plot the distribution curves. So it was a struggle at first. And um, with the Python API, sometimes when you, um, when you also when you do like ee dot authorize and then you have to like you move away from your computer and you come back like when you try to um authorize again sometimes there is a little bit of an issue but i i sent an email to um queen shen Wu and he guided me as to how to um you know correct this um misfunction yeah that's great. I'm glad you you managed to get some um, support and help from from other people in the community, and that that's something that we we try to encourage, um, where we are building like a, a nice community of people, even on Twitter, where people can ask questions and answer questions and help each other. So that's that's a great example. Thank you, Matilda. And over to you, Julia. Do you have any comments about? the Orca app or JavaScript code editor? Um, so I use the JavaScript code editor for that section. And the only challenge that I encountered using the app was getting the steady area um, into the JavaScript. And I was lucky enough that I was helped by um, Abna, Asarian Sabatma who guided me on how to go about it because I'm new to Google Earth Engine and to JavaScript. So she guided me on how to go about it. And I'm very grateful for her help. Great. So I suppose, I, I think um, generally speaking, a lot of people coming to Earth Engine first find it easier to start with the JavaScript API because in the code editor, there's the scripting part, but you can also see your results directly in the map below, or you can yeah. print out some results and see some errors in the, in the site uh, console. So um, for people who are starting out, I think JavaScript is probably the easiest way to start. However, there are now a lot of improvements also in the Python API um, and libraries like GMAP uh, built by Professor Tiushan Wu are making it easier also to use the Python API. And I think in the future, there will also be more um, support and additional functionality for, for Python. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, there was most recently during the uh, Geo for Good Summit, a session on the Python API. So I recommend going to the geo for good 2022 website and you can look for that session and i think it was like python google earth engine python 101 or something like that and you can also have access to the um, colab notebooks which are basically a type of jupyter notebook um, hosted in the cloud in google drive and you can also follow some scripts if you're interested to learn more about the python api so now I have another question for Matilda. And th this question is uh, here. So how accurate are satellite derived estimates of temperature uh, compared to ground observations? Do you have any comments about this or do you have any papers or resources that uh, you'd be able to share? Yes, definitely. Um, I came across some um, papers during my research, and I can post the links in the comment section. Um, but before that, um, I found out that um, for satellite derived estimates, definitely there's going to be some um, noise, some errors, and we are not going to get the same um, the same estimates, temperature estimate as we would get from like a ground observation, which is very, very accurate. And definitely there are going to be some disparities here and there in the estimates. And so I'm going to attach the paper in the comment section for anybody who would like to read more about um, such, um, such questions, yeah. Thank you, Matilda. 
And there's another question also for you. And this question is, uh, why did you use the code built by um, Sophia Amida 2021 rather than using the land surface temperature band, which is included in the land set collection to data sets? Okay, thank you very much for this question. So um, with my quest to learn more about climate change and um, its impact, I took a tutorial from um, NASA assets where they looked at um, mapping out urban heat islands in uh, the general uh, algorithm for mapping out urban heat islands. So this is the first place that I looked at and the source code that the source code that they use for um, this analysis was was to use Sophia Meters um, 2021 land surface temperature algorithm. And so it was based on this that I asked, I also employed the method to um, look at with my research. So it was just, I just looked at this tutorial and I found out that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of importance in, especially with regards to the, um, the parameters that she used, that is the NDVI, the fractional vegetation and the surface emissivity. It came a long way to give variable, um, reliable results for the land surface temperature for the three study areas. So that is basically why I use Sophia Meters 2021 land surface temperature algorithm. Thank you, Matilda. Okay, so looks like we don't have any more questions. If there are some, please add them also now to Slido. So we have um, a few more minutes to answer any questions that you have. So earlier on, Matilda shared a little bit about what is next for her research that she'll be also following up for her master's thesis. And I would like to ask the same question to, to Julia. Uh, what, what is next for you following up on this research or uh, what will you be working on for your, for your thesis research? Um, so for my thesis research, I'd like to look at how climate change is affecting the water body. Um, with this research was looking at how human activities is contributing to the pollution or the degradation of the water body. So I like to look at how climate change is impacting the water body in that aspect. And I would like to further upgrade using the, uh, the Python API, not looking at just a JavaScript, but also looking at the Python API and seeing the differences within that section using those two um, parameters or codes for analysis here. Yeah. That's great. It's really exciting to hear. So um, um, I wish the both of you all the very best for, for your continued you. research in the next semester. And um, I'd like to also invite everybody here to join us again in uh, January, on the 25th of January next year. We're going to have our next meetup then. And the speaker then will be Benjamin Lee from the German Aerospace Center, PLR, and he'll be speaking about cloud-based coastal ecosystem accounting. So this is probably also a bit related to uh, Julia's uh, water quality presentation today. And so if you're interested in ecosystem accounting or coastal ecosystems, please don't forget to tune in. The link is available in the slides and I can share that again with everyone later on as well in an email. So I'd like to thank you all again for your attention and thank again our speakers, um, Matilda Nokia and Julia Atayi for their great presentations today. And join us again next year in January. And in the meantime, I wish all of you happy holidays and a very good end of the year and all the very best for 2023. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you Sabrina too for the opportunity to give our presentation.